It's been more than 60 years since the end of World War II, but the memories of some of the more horrific things to occur in the early 40s still remains with some people. And those people are getting, the opportunity to talk to some of these people is getting rare and rare. People who were in their 20s and remember the period in Germany at the end of the war. But with us today is one of those people, Scotty Cameron. And I'd like to thank you for being here to share your memories. Um, this is part of the Veterans History Project, which is uh, mm -hmm. an initiative of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. And so mm -hmm. we've got some formalities to deal with. My name is Leon Warden, and I'm conducting this interview here at the uh, Channel 20 studio in Newhall, Santa Clarita, California. Today is November 25th, 2008. And uh, <laughs> I know what day it is, so we're off on the right foot, I think. Um, Scotty, give me another date. Tell me what date you were born. August 10th, 1917. That's a little while ago. You're 91. I'm 91. Years old. Where were now, you born? 1970. Where? Where? In Minneapolis. In Minneapolis. Yeah. And you were. Uh, I understand that you went into the army. Yeah. What? Uh, what were the circumstances there? Why did you decide to go into the army? Well, I don't know. Uh, I had to enlist, and the only way I could enlist was to go to my hometown, which is Minneapolis. I lived in Baltimore at that time. Mm -hmm. I worked for the government, federal government. Oh, doing what? Well, clerk. I had a department of my own, <laughs> 125 secretaries. Oh, yeah? File clerks. Yeah. But uh, if they drafted me, I'd have to be drafted out of, out of Baltimore, Maryland. But I wanted to see my family before I went in service, so I said, I'll enlist if you let me go back to Minnesota. Okay, so I'm back to Minnesota, went right into St. Paul, which is a big army center there. Mm -hmm. Went in and they shipped me to uh, Camp McCoy in uh, Wisconsin. It's near Madison, Wisconsin, I think. About maybe a couple hundred miles from Minneapolis. And uh, I had several months of training. Then they loaded us on a train, took us out to the East Coast, stayed there a few days, then boarded a ship for England. I <laughs> can remember in England. When we stopped at the port of North Northampton, I think it was, stopped the port, all the people lined up and said, go on back home, the war is over. Oh, I just said. <laughs> and then what year was it that you went in? 42. The, in 42? Yeah. Okay. So this was in, you were in your late 20s then, or mid 20s, mid late. Early 20s, or mid 20s, yeah, yeah 20 mid 20s, 26, yeah. When you went in. Yeah, 26. But I uh, had a family, I had a wife and two kids. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that you were an engineer with the Army, but you weren't in the Army Corps of Engineers, you were in regular Army. No, I was regular Army, and but I was in, in the Corps of Engineers. You were in the Corps of Engineers? Yeah. Yeah. And we built roads, we repaired highways, we built pontoon bridges mm -hmm. across the rivers the Rhine River. That sounds like the Army Corps of Engineers, was yeah. it? So you had already decided, when you were still stateside, before you had shipped out, you were you already on that engineer's track? You already knew no, that's what you were going to do? No, 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 because I didn't care where they put me. They mm -hmm. asked me to go in the Marines. I said, no way. I couldn't see myself charging up a beach <laughs> with machine guns coming. I did the, the Marines. He well, said, how, how well, how good was the training that they gave you here? It was before? quite well, yeah. quite well. Mach the machine guns and guns, and I remember my grenade. The grenade was quite an experience. And uh, we had to throw grenades, and we had to go through. I went through a gas attack. In training? Yeah, you know? in training. Yeah. yeah, this lieutenant, he threw a gas bomb down there. 
and everybody run, and I run. But the wind was behind me, and as far as I run, it blew that stuff with me. So when I stopped and took a breath, that was bad. Did you get sick? No, I got very dizzy. <laughs> yeah, it was a some kind of a poisonous gas. Mm -hmm. But it was it was legitimate. But I managed to get out of it. So it's 1942, and you get over to England. Yeah. And then what? Where'd you go from there? What happened there? Well, I I joined a company football game, and uh, some big bruiser laid on my right shoulder and broke my left shoulder, rolled it into the ground, so clavicle. So I spent about three months in a hospital. Oh yeah. And the Oval England. Army Hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, by the time I got out, they were ready to, I was in great big shoulder cast. Uh, by the time I got out, they said we're shipping out for Paris. Any fond memories of the nurses there in the uh, hospital? Well, <laughs> I remember one thing, I decided I wanted to lie on my stomach. That was a mistake, so I rolled over in my stomach and it pained so bad that I started hollering. And there was one big bruiser come over who had half his hand shot off, and he put his hand under me and he raised me right up. That's what I remember. That's, I remember that in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did some craft work there, I had that rebuilding. But, uh, I did travel in England, even with that gas on my shoulders. I went to Castle Cary on the train, which was about 50 miles from my camp. Mm -hmm. I was stationed in uh, near the Oval, the Oval, England. Okay. Yeah, our journey, and. Uh, yeah, well, you went. You said you went to Paris after England. Oh yeah, I was in Paris, but we we were supposed to go to the Seine. This is interesting. We were supposed to go to Seine, mm -hmm. the Seine River. The Seine River, yeah. I think Paris is on this side. I don't know, but anyway, we get the word at the last minute that Patton, you know Patton, yeah, General Patton, he, he lost all of his equipment to the Germans, so they took our equipment and gave it to him. Okay. Now this is why I was stuck in England for two months. So I got in late on the war. But, yeah, but it was still, but, what, 43 by this time? Yeah, by 43 this time. And so, so uh, it, uh, maybe I missed the war, I don't know. But I remember looking up, you know, you hear the roar and it got black above me thousands of airplanes going over. Now the, air, air, the war couldn't be over. Not if in 43 was, if it wasn't there was over. there a thousand airplanes mm -hmm. going over bombing Germany. <laughs> I know when, I, when I, drove, I drove a truck all the way through the, my whole service, I was, I was a truck driver. So I drove through Aachen, Aachen, Aachen. Germany, mm -hmm. flat. They had leveled the day before we went through they had bombed that whole... The whole city was just in ruins? Oh, it was in ruins. You didn't see a building standing. Mm -hmm. It was flat. Now, that was on the way to Cologne. Mm -hmm. So, we were in these little camps, you know, that put you around, you know, yeah. until they could find a place for you. And uh, I remember crossing the channel, and... Uh, I went late because of this broken shoulder. My mm -hmm. company had already gone. I was in the headquarters of the service companies of the 1263rd. So I went over on a later contention. And uh, it was interesting. I, I'm glad I experienced the whole thing. Now, what, what was your rank at this time? What was the highest rank that you did achieve? A sergeant. Sergeant. Yeah, okay. I was, uh, my, my, my tech sergeant came through just by the time I was ready to go home. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, you just got your service stripes. I said, I don't need them, I'm going home. So I went home, as I say, in 45. Oh, yeah, I got home in 46. In 46. Yeah, yeah. in January. 46, I remember. 
No, it's about 1943. Well, we, you weren't in, it would have been 44. If you 44, were in Cologne, it would have been 44. Yes, yeah, that's when the whole Zollern Bridge was dropped. The Germans dropped it. Mm -hmm. And so we had to build a, a, a pontoon bridge mm -hmm. across the Rhine River. Tell me about that. I didn't do it. I was supply <laughs> sergeant. Company A, B, and C did the work. And as supply sergeant, uh, well, tell me about what your job was as supply sergeant. Well, I had to keep all the guys equipped with their equipment. Mm -hmm. One guy comes and said, my somebody sold my shoes. Will you order me a new pair? I said, no. Why not? I said, because you sold your shoes for 20 bucks. So why should I give you a new pair? I wouldn't give him a new pair. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're making money off it. <laughs> this kind of experience. And one thing, as we went into buildings, we took over their buildings. We took over a hotel. Right. There was a desk in that lobby of the hotel. Germans are gone. We took over the whole hotel. So I found the key and I opened the desk. Oh, there must have been $200,000 in German money in that desk. In German money? In German money, which isn't worth a nickel in America. <laughs> All Hitler money. So, But we're talking, is this 44, is it 45, has the war over yet? I mean, we're, no, the war's not no, over. No, the, the, the Battle of the Bulge was after we got there, okay. because that's how Patton it's lost 44, our equipment, right. why we had two months extra stay in okay. England because of Patton losing our yeah. equipment, taking ours. So we had to wait until new equipment came out. We had D8s, tractors, mm -hmm. and six-ton trucks, which we needed for our work, and, and compressors. So uh, maybe that was fortunate. If I'd gone over before, I would have gotten the bulge, in the Battle of the Bulge, but I, I missed that. So, uh, so we said we traveled in several towns. Cologne is this town that I remember so well. I believe it was out of Cologne that I took my adventurous the northern, trips. Northern Germany. Yeah, took my adventurous trips, and the captain said, you know, try to get to these prison camps because we want a record of this. Yeah, we want to know what's going on there. In prison camps in Germany. In Germany, yeah. The prisoner of war camp, German prisoner Prison. of war camps That's where right. they the allied. The one I went to happened to be a Polish camp. I know there was a big Polish fellow in our company. And when he went through the camp, I, I saw him. He was crying. He, he was heartbroken. <laughs> He was saying, I don't know whether I'd say this on TV, and but... he's talking about something that he saw in Poland? Yeah. And, no, in Germany. In Germany. At the camp that I went to. At the to. camp that you went to in Germany. He walked around saying, God damn, God damn. He was hurting. I was hurting. So, this is how I managed to get into this camp. I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. You know, when I went there, it was, here was a church with a graveyard behind it. And then this little road went past this church up a hill to the farmhouse. It was a legitimate German farmhouse. All right, now, as you came down the road here, just a little ways was a garage. This is my experience, my first experience with the people. Now. It was a double garage with the door removed, 16-foot door removed. And they had stacked bodies, man. And the way you stack them is you take the hands, I'll take the feet and throw them. And the pile was 10 foot high and 20 foot wide of all the other people. Uh, this was my first experience with it, with seeing all these dead people. Now, maybe with a hundred people in that barn or in that garage. Then I walked down just a little way. There was a fire. Five men 
prisoners sitting around the fire. It had a five gallon paint can on the fire. And sticking out of this paint can was a dog, a dog's leg. And it happened to be a German Shepherd dog because I'm familiar with dogs. I know the hair, I know the feet and the claws and everything. Didn't even bother to skin it. They just put it in the pail. I said, what are they doing? I talked to one of the guys there. What are they doing? He said, they're making soup. Well, that's kind of a bad way to make soup, you know. So then from there, I walked just down a little ways. Here was a great big barn, a farm barn. You know what they're like. You know where you store all your hay. Mm -hmm. Gee, they had beds in there. The place was filled with beds, if you call them beds. They're two by fours, five stories high with platforms, plywood platforms, no bedding or anything, just platform, mm -hmm. and the bodies stacked up on that. Now that place was, well, it was pretty well empty. There's one, one guy laying there right near the door. Now this, this impressed me very much. This, this hurt me, this went right through me. He was lying near the door. I said to the medic there, he said, is that man dead or alive? They said, we don't know. The only way you can tell is to put a mirror in front of his nose or mouth, and if it fogs up, he's alive. So we don't know whether he's alive or dead. Now, this is the point of starvation. So what impressed me was that all the GIs, all of us soldiers, when we went by, this guy was completely helpless. But they gave everything they had. They emptied their pockets and gave to this man. He couldn't use it. Cigarettes, cigarette lighters, oranges, apples, chewing gum, candy bars. This told, this told me a lot about the GI. <laughs> well, anyway, I was emotionally upset when I saw this, this, and then to see this barn with all these. Now, this barn was almost empty, and the reason it was almost empty was next to the barn was a 100-foot trench, six foot wide and six foot deep, and they had thrown the bodies in there. That's before I came. But they went into town and got all the men out, and they made them dig those bodies out, and they wrapped each one with a sheet, put them in a truck, and took them down to the graveyard. And they still ended up in a trench, mm -hmm. but at least they had a Christian burial. They had a chaplain there, and they had an army band there. Mm -hmm. This is what broke me up completely when they were playing the old rugged cross. Oh, yeah. So anyway, the trench was empty, but it was all red from blood. Mm -hmm. In other words, they just dumped them in there. They didn't bury them, they dumped them in there. Now they're having a Christian burial. Well, this, this kind of made me very tender-hearted. I, I happen to be a very emotional person. You guys, you could tell. I'm, I'm having difficult telling you what happened. Okay. This burial of these hundreds of people who had been thrown into a trench was the culmination of the whole thing. And then the band playing the, mm -hmm. the old rugged cross. It just, I mean, I, but I wasn't ashamed of crying because everybody was crying. Every GI there was, they were crying, unashamed of mm -hmm. their tears, tears rolling down their cheeks, and tears running down my cheeks too. And then this poor Polish guy, out, almost out of his mind. This is his father. This is his uncle. This could be his brother. We're piled up there in that garage. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I do, and I've got a couple of questions. Here, I mean, yeah. we're you're. This is a German prisoner of war, a yeah. former German prisoner of war camp, because the Germans obviously had already they had been, left. They'd been they'd been driven out. They'd, they'd been kicked out. The, so the, camp the allies had, 
it was the Allies that would have come along. Yeah. Not the Soviets, but the Allies. Oh, the Allies. The Allies came along and pushed them out. So now here, now the army comes in, and now all of a sudden, here's this prisoner of war camp where yeah. then the, and the, it, it, it was the Germans who piled up the bodies, obviously, oh, yes, in the garage. Yes. And it was the Germans, it was at the... Was it the Germans who had thrown them into the trench? And, yes. Uh, yeah. By the barn. Yeah. And why would they have? Why would they have done that? Was it to uh, get rid of them? Get rid of the evidence. It's it, my opinion. It was. You think it was to get rid of evidence? Yeah. In other words, they didn't want these people tell them how they'd been living. Okay. So. They so did, you think that they when? Did, they wait a minute. Do you think that when the Germans were then leaving, when the Allies were coming in, the Germans were leaving? Do you think that the Germans just killed everybody then? I don't know. I don't know. They left, the whole, hadn't been they left up. the whole garage full of bodies. And those, those bodies, now I'm sorry to make you describe this, but those bodies hadn't been, they hadn't been like accumulating over time. They were no. all there at once. They weren't like, they, were all, at they were all in like the same kind of condition. Yeah. They were very emaciated. Mm -hmm. Legs, but this round. I don't know whether I can mention it. I can't mention it on the tape because I knew that women and children were going to hear this tape. Mm -hmm. So, but the rectum was nobody wore pants, mm -hmm. and all of those bodies in there. I asked the medic. I said, "Why are they all without pants?" He said, "They have the, the diarrhea and dysentery. They didn't dare to wear pants. Their rectum. Can I say the word?" Sure was emaciated between three inches and five inches in yeah. diameter. I yeah. said to the medic, how come? He said that, that dysentery mm -hmm. eats it away. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And did they, did they, um, were, the, were, the, were all the bodies na totally naked or was it just pants no, that they wore? No, on? they had shirts on. They had on. shirts on. Everyone had shirts on but no pants. Mm -hmm. I asked about that, why? Why do I have my pants? Oh, you can't wear pants when you have diarrhea and dysentery. Right. Yeah. Now, these, these were prisoners of war. They were prisoners. These were not Jews who had been rounded up and brought some of to them this are, place. Some, some of them were. My opinion was it was when they went into Poland, they didn't care what the man's religion was. Right. They just threw him in a truck and hauled him to this farm where he was put to work, mm -hmm. but they didn't feed him. And you don't so you think these? So you think these prisoners? These prisoners would have been forced to. They would have been forced labor. They would have forced been forced labor. to work on this farm. On this farm. Do farming. Yeah, that's right. That's what. Uh, that's why I think they chose this farm, because they had some place to have the men work, mm -hmm. but no food, and so. Do you have an understanding of what? Sort of farming this was what sort of work the far, were the, the prisoners were I don't know forced that. to do. I don't know that. I don't know. Was what? it just a farm with crops, or were there other things? They weren't like involved in any kind of you know no. machinery making no. or anything. No, like that. Was, no, not machinery or anything. Because I know some prisoners did have to. Yeah, do that. yeah, they were. Yeah, they did that. Yeah, in Dachau they did that. Mm -hmm. And in some of the bigger prison camps, but as I say, this was just a farm. And it was a way to dump these Polish men. Mm -hmm. So these were mostly people who had been brought from Poland. From Poland, yeah. They're all, and, but yeah. it was in Germany. It was in Germany, yeah. They picked them up in Poland, in trucks, anyone on the streets. What did they call this? Would they, would they, a purge, if you call it? They didn't want any hmm. man who could shoot a rifle. Right. So they had to get rid of them. And they had to get rid of them by putting them in these camps. And uh, they weren't violent people. They were just plain ordinary people. Mm -hmm. What was your job in relation to all this? Or did you have one in, in relation? I mean, Not, you were sent to look at the camps. What were you, sent, what were you supposed to do? Well, well, just to observe so that I would know what was happening and I could somehow tell people. I told the German 63 years later, talk about it. <laughs> later, talk about it. I, I, I talked to the German people and they said, oh, baloney. Mm -hmm. This is just a, a scare job that the Americans have created. Nobody is treated like that. Hmm. They were. I saw them. You know, I saw the dead. National state of denial. 
actually deny it. They denied that Hitler could do anything like this. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I said, I saw it. I was there. I was in this camp. And the war was still on at this time. Oh, and, yes. And, oh, and, yes, and, because from leaving from there. Well, right, right after that, we were, we were bivouacking. In other words, they said, you go to a certain place mm -hmm. and you establish this camp. Okay. And while we were coming down the road, we were stopped by GIs. MPs, you can't go down that road right. because the Germans just took it over. Oh yeah, you're driving right into German territory. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yes, the war was still on. So when we when we got to this little town, we took over the whole town. We moved into the houses, mm -hmm. and they said anybody who goes out of the building will be shot. My gun was down in the truck, so my, tr so I was wearing an upside upstairs room, and they said three hundred German elite parachutists have just landed in the field over here, and we expect an attack. Mm -hmm. So yes, the war was still on, and when you can't go down this road because the Germans just took over this community or this land here, mm -hmm. and you can't go down this road, and you, and you can't go out of your building or you'll be shot because the Germans are, we expected an attack that night. Mm -hmm. That attack didn't come because the infantry, well, I give credit to the infantry. <laughs> they went out and wiped them out. Overnight. Save my butt. <laughs> so, yes, that's how close I came and to. And this was the last few months of the war. Yeah, it was. I, remember, I was there when the, when the uh, Germans surrendered. Yeah, I want to get to that, but this is yeah. the time, this is the last few months of the war when basically Hitler was recruiting, you know, the Hitler youth and, you know, 14, yeah. 15, 16 yeah. year old right. kids to go yeah. attack at night. Did you ever encounter any kids? No, the only thing I encountered was, uh, <laughs> this was an interest, and I think you'll find it. Uh, I went up to Berlin, and to the Berlin airport. Mm -hmm. And- Tempelhof. Tempelhof, and right down the street there, behind the airport, there was a parade, we'll call it a parade, of German soldiers who were, capitulated to the Americans because they knew the Americans would feed them. Now there were a lot of them that didn't want to, didn't want to uh, give up to the Soviets. That's right, yes. They didn't want to give up to the Soviets. So now there was 550 Germans marching down the street. Uh, the officers were, were put in trucks, but the men pulled the trucks with ropes. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? They had no gas. Mm -hmm. When the when the as I I think I mentioned to you that when the sky was black and there was a thousand oh. airplanes went over, one of the targets was Plisti, P L E I S T I, and that was an oil town. Okay. So when they bombed Plisti, the Germans had no gasoline. Okay. So right. they had to pull their carts and wagons and trucks by ropes and manpower. Now, were you in on the final assault on Berlin? No. No. No, I wasn't in on that. But that same day, we come driving down the road, and a GI stopped us, you know. He sat stand there with a great big machine gun, and, and he said, will you help us, help me with these three uh, SS troopers? He said, I don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. I said, take them out of the woods and shoot them. I said, these men are no good to, to the population, to Earth. They're no good on Earth. SS men, six foot six, 350 pounds. So anyway, he said, will you search them? I'm five foot nine, eight, five, six. I'm five foot six. And I look up at this guy, you know. <laughs> And he snarled at me. Man, I was scared to death. That's why I said, take these guys in the woods and shoot them. Oh, he said, I might get in trouble. 
I said, do you think that the Americans are going to feed these guys, these SS troopers? Shoot them. Of course, SS were the ones who ran the concentration camps and the prisoner of war system and everything else. Well, they were. They became American prisoners because right. this guy had captured them in the woods. Mm -hmm. It just happened that I happened to go by there. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to help him. I said, if you put them guys in the back of your truck, you're going to end up dead because those three guys will kill you. So you kill them first. <laughs> Do you know what happened? I don't know. Mm -hmm. He said, you won't help me? And I said, no, I won't help you. I, 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 can't, I don't think I could shoot a man at cold blood. I, I don't think I could. I'm too soft-hearted. No. Did you ever shoot anybody at all? No, I didn't. I've been asked that question. Did you ever kill anybody? I said, I've never had anybody in my sights. I've been in the sights of the, of the Americans. In other words, three of us went to town. When we came back, halt, who goes there? Oh. Well, the other. You stayed out a little too late one she night, huh? stayed out too late. And so the two or three of us hid in the bushes, mm -hmm. and they fired at us. The bullets were clipping those bushes we were laying. So the three of us started whistling Dixie <laughs> <laughs> because it was black uh, uh, guards, you know. Oh, gee, that, you know, this is, this is where under fire, I was under fire. <laughs> yeah. The bullets were just clipping us. <laughs> so, did you have a job in when you were in Berlin? What were you What were you supposed to be doing? I mean, where, why were you there? Bill Bridges. In, okay. I just happened to we had A B C company, and mm -hmm. they were the workers. And headquarters and service companies was the administration yeah. of the whole battalion. So I was supply sergeant for the company. Do you have and, special privileges as supply oh, sergeant? Oh, yes, I had a special privilege. Only the first sergeant didn't like me, and I didn't like him. And I was almost court-martialed a couple times. And I said, don't, don't, don't think you can court-martial me because I'm not a soldier. I'm a civilian. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yes, I, I was an ornery son of a gun. Yeah? I was ornery. How so? Oh, jeez. Well, uh, tell me a story about uh, your supply right, so sergeant days. My captain said, shave off that mustache. I still got it. <laughs> I said, how long have you had yours? He said, about 12 years. I said, I've had mine for, since I was 16. I said, I'm not about to shave this off. You shave yours off. <laughs> Court martial. Yeah. I wasn't scared of court martial. The only thing they could do was put me in jail. They couldn't put me in a labor camp. They couldn't send me to one of them prison camps. They couldn't do anything. That's right. You know, going back to that prison camp, do you, you don't remember where that farm was. No, yeah. I don't remember the name That's of okay. the That's okay. Was there, was that the only prisoner of war camp that you saw? Or were yes, there? I never went. Oh, I have a story about another one. I was invited. The captain says, you go to this prison camp. It wasn't a prison camp. But I got the story from one of my buddies. I refused to go. So he said he went, and there was a huge barn, another farm, mm -hmm. 3,500 people, men and women. So they run them into this barn to confine them. We couldn't have them run at all. Mm -hmm. They run them into the barn. And then they stationed soldiers, German soldiers, around the barn. If anybody dug underneath, they shot them. Now this is, I didn't see it, because mm -hmm. I wasn't there. But this is what I heard from this yeah. guy. So he showed me pictures of it. Anyway, they started the barn on fire. Who did? The Germans. Mm -hmm. They started the barn on fire. All the people inside were still alive? Uh, with they were still alive, mm -hmm. and they killed 3,500 men and women. Now, I, I had the picture of the bodies laying out, a block long, laying out, because when the Americans came, they dragged these people up, laid them side by side, half burned, charred, dead, all dead, 3,500. All dead, and the guy gave me the picture, and 
I have many pictures of my experiences there. But I put them in a box, and when I moved, they disappeared. Oh, that's too bad. See, I sold my house yeah. when I, after my wife died. My wife died in 84, mm -hmm. 04, 2004, in 04. Okay. and uh, June. And uh, since then, I've been on the road. I'm thinking of moving in with my son, but I don't know whether he wants me. Your son he, lives here in Santa Clarita, and you live Well, he, he used to live in Santa Clarita. He, used to live in Santa he Santa moved Clarita, to right? Arizona. Where do you live now? I live in Burbank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've been there a long time? Uh, 56 years. In Burbank? Yeah. Oh, okay. 52, I moved there. Mm -hmm. So 56 years. So, so uh, I don't want to leave because all my friends are there. Mm -hmm. See, I go to church twice a week, Sunday and Wednesdays, Bible study. Mm -hmm. And I have, you should see the 90th birthday they gave for me. Oh man, I, I didn't expect it. <laughs> but it was wonderful. And I've got many, many friends there. You know, I've got to ask, I see you're missing a finger. Did that happen yeah. in the war? No. No. Neither did this. Yeah. I happen to be a carpenter and a cabinet maker, and I run my saw for 50 years, no trouble. All of a sudden, I'm sending a piece of plywood. Hey, my finger is gone. I, I had to go in the house and put it in ice. My wife went out and picked it up and put it in the ice. We went to the hospital, and this is what they did to it. They couldn't uh, quite save it then. Huh? See, I can embarrass a lot of people. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I, go, I go to, I go to, I was an elder in the <laughs> church. I go to an elders meeting, and all I have to do is this, and the guys <laughs> break up around me, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's funny. Were uh, you injured at all in, in, in your no. during the, in your no, I didn't have any injuries. Yeah. I had close calls, but yeah. I remember one American time shooting bullets at you. But <laughs> I, I remember one time, as I say, I was a truck driver and I was driving a six-ton truck, and and we're going to invade a town. Oh, Captain, I'm too old to invade a town. You know. Uh, yeah, you were up there. You were like 28 by now. I was 28 by then. So he said, you drive the truck. All right, now, it was the truck that had a ring around the roof with a 45 caliber machine gun with a guy standing there swinging that gun all directions. And uh, this Polish fellow that I told you, was sitting on my left fender with a submachine gun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> now we sent a motorcycle through the first, through the town, and we waited on the outskirts. And, uh, and then we're going to invade this town. Now, the day before, our uh, company, A or B, uh, went with a lieutenant to invade a town. And they sent the motorcycle all the way through, and he went through, no trouble. He turned around and come back. So when the jeep started through with Lieutenant on, the Germans opened fire. Mm -hmm. They were hiding behind the houses, and they, they were in machine gun nests, and they killed a few soldiers, and they blew up some of our equipment. But uh, no, this is what I was expecting, and my foot was pumping on that. Oh, I was scared. I'm no hero. I'm no hero. Did you lose friends, personal friends? No. No. Oh, two or three, four or five in our company, yes. Mm -hmm. they, not from combat, though. They were killed from truck act or, you know, accidents. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, no, I never lost any of my close friends mm -hmm. in, in uh, combat. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I now will never forget that day when he fed that town because when we finally, the motorcycle come back and he said, it's okay, all clear. So we started in, me with the lead truck and the captain next to me and a big machine gun on top of me and a, and a machine gun on the fender. Mm -hmm. So 
we got in just inside the town and the windows opened up and the people threw a sheet, threw a sheet out the window. In other words, we surrender. Yeah. Don't shoot. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Boy, you, you don't know the feeling. What was the mood like, you know, what was it May fifth or sixth or whatever it was, nineteen forty five, you know, when uh, when Germany surrendered? Oh what was what describe that what it was like. Oh, it was terrible for the GIs. Too many of them got drunk. Too many of them got drunk. I didn't myself. I didn't have the I drank a lot of wine and stuff, but I didn't get drunk. I had my brain with me all the time, but too many of the boys did. It was a wild celebration. Well, you can imagine. The war is over. No more buddies shooting at us. I was machine gun in, uh, in uh, right next door to the uh, Hohenzollern Bridge. And that was right where the Cologne Cathedral was. Mm -hmm. And the bridge was right next to it. And I noticed that at the entrance to that bridge, there was a great big horse with the Hohenzollern commander. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a laying down. Okay. And the church was bombed. The church was pretty well destroyed. Great big beautiful cathedral right on the Rhine. I never did, oh, I took one trip down the Rhine. Uh, somebody took me on a boat. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I enjoyed that. But as I say, I had a wonderful experience when I was over. Tell you one What was wonderful about it? Well, I'll tell you one story that I'll never forget. So I was going into a little town. Now, the, the tanks, United States tanks came around the curb like this. Mm -hmm. And up on the hill, they had, put, had a battery of 88s, which is anti-aircraft mm -hmm. firing guns. And they laid them down. Oh, yeah? And they blasted those tanks the day before I came. They just blasted. They wiped out that whole column of American tanks. Well. I went to this town with my truck. As I say, I was very adventurous. I went to this town looking for guns, because guns are a great thing to have. Souvenirs, mm -hmm. all the guns I could collect. So I met, I met a guy there. I picked up a gun from a pile, and I met a guy there, and he was a Russian soldier. And, and uh, now, we were close to the Russian lines, mm -hmm. see? So he said, uh, throw that away. I'll take you where you can get hundreds of guns. Okay, jump in a truck. Mm -hmm. So we started down the road, and we come to a, a Russian checkpoint. Mm -hmm. Oh, what are you guys doing here? That's an American. Yeah, American truck on Russian lines. We're boating. So, so this Russian talked to them mm -hmm. and said, we're just looking for guns. Yeah. We're not going to invade Russia. So they let us through. So we went down there. And here was when the Germans surrendered, they had to throw their guns in a pile, mm -hmm. rifles and pistols. I got some of the most beautiful pistols you could ever want to see. I'm talking about chrome-plated and ivory-handled things and mm. uh, pistols, not uh, revolvers, you know, not automatic stuff. So this guy, this Russian, he went in the woods and picked up a suitcase. He said, we'll put the guns in the suitcase. So, okay, put it back in my truck. So we started down the road, and here was 12 or 15 Cossacks, Russian Cossack. You know what a Cossack mm -hmm. is? Boy, great big mustaches, yeah. you know. And the, these guys. And said, big furry hats oh, and all big that. Big furry kind of hats stuff. and all that stuff, yeah. And, and real on, on, on uh, horses that were wild as the Dickens. And, they were on horses? Yeah, so they stopped us. What are you doing over here? American mm -hmm. truck in Russia? And Russian in lines? Russian sector, yeah. Russian territory. So the Russians told them, we're just looking for guns. 
So the head guy got off his horse and comes over. He looks in the, picked out the best pistols, a couple of them. The best pistols that I had prized, you know. Mm -hmm. He took them, stuck them in his belt, sure. got on the horse and gave the signal and off they went, see. So then we got back to the checkpoint. Mm -hmm. They had changed the guards. Uh oh. Now this was bad because that, that officer in charge of the whole thing, he ran over there. He was so surprised to see a German or an American truck. I drove the three quarter ton, you know, with the canvas over. Mm -hmm. So he stuck his machine gun and I'm looking down, it's got a round clip on it. He sucked that into my stomach, and the more I sucked in, the deeper he went. I thought, this is the end of the old Scotsman. So, 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 he, he, the German said, or the Russian said, you got any cigarettes? And I said, glove compartment. So I had the cartons, two cartons of cigarettes in there. So when he gave the two cartons to this, he pulled the machine gun away. Oh, jeez, I'll tell you, I started to breathe then, because I thought this was the end of my life. All he had to do was pull that trigger once, and it would have cut me right in half. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, they let us through then, because we gave them the cigarettes. And we drove back to camp at night. Now, this is nighttime when we got back to camp. I got back to camp. I was alone. We, I dropped Russian soldier off at the... Uh, the camp ride picked him up. Mm -hmm. And so I left the truck and went into the, my room. I had a room there in one of the hotels or something. And uh, next morning I come out, all of my guns were gone. Mm -hmm. Suitcase and everything was gone. Mm -hmm. Somebody, you know, stole them. So I don't know who. I, Do you still have other mementos from the war? I sent a lot of them home, but the yeah. kids. Yeah. I had a watch. Well, a lot of people sent home. You know, yes, I sent home guns. I sent home a Schmeiser. Oh, here's the story. That's, I sent home a Schmeiser. Now, I tell people this story. They say, oh, you, you baloney. There's no such thing as a Schmeiser. I used to have one. It's a small automatic gun. Machine gun. Machine gun with little cheap tin mm -hmm. sides. You took those guns off, you had a basic I'll tell you another story, how I got in trouble with that. I had one of those Schmeisers. So, so uh, I found a case of, of cartridges. So the cartridge is about this long, each one's got eight, 10, or 12 bullets in it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the captain he, he said, get rid of that case of ammunition, but don't let anyone know about it. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to fall into German hands. Okay, this reminds me of another story I gotta tell you. So, 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 uh, I said, okay, I'll get rid of it. I went out to a place, there was a lake there and a big hill behind it. So I started firing these cartridges, you know. Mm -hmm. And I almost done when a jeep drives up, and a lieutenant gets off me. He said, what in the hell do you think you're doing? I said, the captain told me I had to get rid of all these machine gun bullets because they don't want to fall into German hands. So I'm just shooting. He said, you've got a whole company of men pinned behind this hill. <laughs> <laughs> they, they think it's a German machine gun nest. <laughs> now that's funny. Yeah, so so he said, no more shooting like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. I had a legitimate excuse. My captain told me to get that's rid right. of that ammunition. I'm getting rid. How are you going to do Dumping it? Dumping it in the lake wouldn't have been good enough, No, huh? no, that wouldn't be good. If they ever dug it out, they could use it. Right. So, so uh, this, is, this is another funny experience. We were living in this room where I said where I was on the second floor and if you go outside they'll, they'll get shot. Yeah. Well anyway, the next day, the, German, the, the Germans were conquered, the ones that were going to invade us. Okay. So he said, 
There's a hotel there. There's a dead cow laying in the hotel, in the barn, stable. You know, their stables are right up to, here's the stable, here's the kitchen. Yeah. So he said, get rid of that cow. I said, yeah, we got, we got 125 men here. Why do you have to pick me? He didn't like me. I didn't like him. So I said, okay. He said, you tow that cow out and bury it. So I got a rope connected to the feet of the cow. Now, it happened that the cow was in calf. It was dead. But the feet of the calf were sticking out. Sticking out? It. Yeah. So I told that thing that I saw a machine gun nest that the Germans had been run out of. It was on the street, alongside the street. Mm -hmm. I said, I think I can straddle that. It was a, a pit dug where they got down in the pit right. and then had their machine guns in the same town that we had just conquered. So, so I straddled that. The cow dropped in. So I cut the rope. I was about to untie that thing from the feet. Yeah. So I cut the rope, and so I threw dirt on it, got my shovel, covered it, see? Oh, jeez. Next day, the sergeant come. He said, you didn't bury that cow. I said, yeah, I buried it. I buried that cow. He said, uh, yeah, I want to show you something. So we went out there, and here, one leg stick him up and the whole stomach of the cow coming out of the ground. You see it is it fermented? Yeah, yeah. They the stomach blow up, right. gases yeah. and it came right up out of the ground. So he said, You dig that up and rebury it. Didn't bury it deep enough. Oh jeez. So I went to the lieutenant. I said, Lieutenant, I said, I'm not gonna bury that cow and I'm not gonna dig that cow up. He said, what are you talking about? Well, I told him, the cow's coming out of the ground, coming right out like it's live. So he went out there and looked at it. He said, is that your biggest problem? I said, it is today. So he pulled out a 45, and he shot six or eight shots into that stomach. And I cow, was going to say, just take out a lance uh, and stab the thing. Yeah, that like cow just laid right yeah, down sure. into the dirt. Yeah, I mean, he said, throw some dirt on it and tell that sergeant to go, yeah. you know. You don't rebury it, you just now stab that, it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but I didn't know that. I, I'm not a cheese. But that was one of the embarrassing and rough experiences. It is funny, you know, you said that... Uh, you know, we, we, we started this a while ago by you saying you had a wonderful experience. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, you, yeah, you, you, yeah. You, saw the, you saw the prison camps. Yeah. You got shot at. You know, you, you got You're threatened by at. the Russians and all that kind of stuff. Am I missing something? What was so wonderful? Well, I don't know. As sergeant, I had all the candy I could eat and all the cigars I could <laughs> smoke. And I had some authority. Yep. Huh? In fact, when the first sergeant went, he pulled, chose me, and he said, you line the man up and have morning, whatever you call it. I thought, like, oh, geez, a little five-foot-nine guy standing there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, so I six-foot-six sergeants, you know. Yeah. I'd say, sergeant, report. He'd have to say, company so-and-so, all present. This is all there was to it. But... Uh, so I had a little authority, so I, I, I thought it was nice, you know. I, I, geez, I saw Paris, I saw London, I saw Antwerp, Belgium. I was a bunch of German cities, and even if they were flattened, you probably would have never seen them otherwise. That's hmm? right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the German cities were devastated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gee, I'll tell you, the thousand bombers are going over, yeah. all of them with these big bombs. And the sky was blackened, and it took maybe an hour before those all went over. Mm -hmm. Boy, you stood up there looking at made you feel proud. You got out in 46, and, you know, I know that you said that before you went in, you were working for the government, you had your own department, all these secretaries and everything, but then what, you got out and you became a carpenter? Yeah. Well, I became a furniture, not furniture, lumber salesman. Okay. You see, how'd I, you fall into that? 
Well, it was all the it, supply it, thing, huh? See, when I was in Washington and I had this all this big authorities, these big shots used to come to me and say, "Can I look in your files?" Mm -hmm. Well, you got to identify yourself before you can look in my files. So, I met some high price guys in 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 uh, Baltimore and Washington. And they, one of them, was from a lumber company in Burbank. Mm -hmm. I said, geez, I'd like to live in Burbank, you know. So he gave me a letter introducing me, saying, this is Scotty, you know. So when I got out of the service, we were in Minneapolis, I got, I joined a car going out, driving out to the coast alone, four guys driving out that we just paid 30 bucks. And he and his wife, the driver and his wife, and the four guys sitting at the back. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so when I got here, I took that letter to the lumber company, and geez, they hired me right away. Yeah. Yeah, so I became a lumber salesman. Got to wrap it up, but you know, I, I don't imagine Scotty was your given name. I mean, that's that's no, all no, your nickname I to that, me. I got that in in the army. Yeah. They, they said they called me the crazy Scotsman. Oh, your Scotch heritage yeah, and all that. Yeah. And what what is your what is, what was your given name? What, how were you born? What was your name? Oh well, my mother named me Chester, against my. I was too young to protest. Yeah, yeah I was going to say against your wishes, but maybe you didn't Chester care when you were young. Chester and I have hated that name all my. <laughs> Now, when I get labeled Sanchez Chester Cameron, I throw them away. Yeah, good for you. What do you want to leave folks with? I mean, you know, 60 some odd years later, what yeah. do you want the young people today to know about your experience? Don't go to a prison camp. Did I tell you that my wife would wake me up at night? She'd say, are you crying? I'd say, yes. Why? I'm dreaming I'm back in the in the prison camp. And I'm just reliving the thing. And I'm, I'm sobbing, sobbing out loud and sobbing enough to wake her up. So I mean, this, is, this has been with me. I couldn't tell the story for 60 years. And then when I put it on tape, I cried the whole time through. Yeah. You couldn't hardly understand because I was very, as I say, I'm, a, I'm an emotional person and a religious person. Well, Scotty, I want to thank you very much for sharing your story with everybody today and for your willingness to participate in the Veterans History Project. Well, I'm glad to get do it, it because again. this story should be told. This is, a, this, this is what the war was all about, these present camps. Not all, but a big part of it. And so I'm happy to be able to get my story out. to parades, high school bands, and celebrations. We welcome them with open arms, as heroes. Their tours of duty are behind them. Their challenges are not. Many will spend longer coming back from the war than they spent in the war, retraining, searching for jobs, recovering from scars, some visible, some not. Find out what you can do to help at welcomebackveterans.org.